Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Conversations. Well, here we are again, back on the microphone. Yeah, sorry for the little pause break, guys. I know we were like, we're back, welcome back, and then disappeared. (laughs) Real life, though, got in the way. I mentioned this on Twitter, but might as well just say it. We had to make a rapid move over the last month what was it september time is irrelevant in this yeah it seems like it's been both two days and a thousand years so pod and research took a back seat however we have a couple of things that we're really excited about looking forward here in the cosmere universe because yeah things are like heating up a little bit we got a white sand just came out if you didn't know white sand volume three i believe this is the final one yep Um, the trilogy complete yep again since we moved i am still waiting for my coffee to be sent to the right address (laughs) so (laughs) i don't have it yet but we will definitely have a pod on that coming up soon so again if you like haven't gotten it haven't read it yet put that on your to-do list that's our public service announcement when you order a cosmere book so far in advance that (laughs) you may move in the intervening period it is often a good idea to check out which address you sent your cosmere books to yeah i definitely ordered it like a year ago (laughs) (laughs) As soon as it was announced. Yeah, basically as soon as Cosmere books are available, I pre-order them. And so we'll be looking at White Sand in our next episode, but there is also news out of the Sanderson cave itself, and that is that Brandon has just announced that he is two-thirds of the way done with Stormlight 4 for just some... First draft. Yes, obviously there will be a couple of edits, uh, and we're expecting 2020 late fall. Yeah, I think fall 2020. So maybe like one year. About a year year from now. Yeah, exactly. We're almost at the possible year countdown, basically. So get hyped. Uh, (laughs) Time to start getting excited. (laughs) As always, on Cosmere Conversations, we have a standing hashtag, all spoilers. So even if this is your first time or... It's just been such a long time since you've listened to the episodes. All spoilers all the time. And on that note, I'm very excited and very much looking forward to the split backstories in Stormlight 4. We have Venli and Eshenai. What was originally planned... I was going to say, is that confirmed? It's 100% confirmed at this point. Nice. So he has... Okay. Brandon has expanded the backstory portion of Stormlight 4 uh, to be now split between Eshenai and Venli. Yeah, which we've talked about this before on the pod. We have always said that that basically has to be the case because one, Eshenai is now dead as far as we know. Two, like we already got a lot of her backstory. So... Essentially, the pieces that we don't have are Venli. Well, I think it was originally planned as all Eshenai, and we now have full confirmation from Brandon himself that it is basically a 50 50 split between Eshenai and Venli. And I think. Yeah, I find that unsurprising. Yeah, we're (laughs) coming from the top down. I don't want to pretend like we made these changes by... Oh, we did. (laughs) Brandon Sanderson, long friend of the pod, was just listening one day and was like, like, you know, I think Brooke and Tyler really have the right idea. (laughs) That's correct. That's actually what happened. That's what happened. And he called (laughs) us and thanked us and invited us over to dinner. He's a very nice gentleman. Uh, (laughs) Lovely family. Great friend of the pod. Uh, We have been kind of hearing this vented from Sanderson himself for a while, but it's hard confirmed. 
He's two thirds of the way done, and I think he is 100% done with the flashback portions of the novel. He said that in I think Twitter that's, update. Yeah, a lot of the times, one of the first things that like, yeah, he writes out of. To, yeah. Our full episode today is derived from a couple of social media posts, a couple of Reddit posts, a couple of Coppermine things where there were a bunch of different questions all that kind of boiled down to what are you looking forward to? I think everybody's kind of feeling the Cosmere drought. Yeah, we're like deep in it now. And so it's that time when you like either sink or swim. You either stay up on the podcast. Like I have to say this, Oathbringer, our episode entitled Oathbringer is by far our most downloaded episode (laughs) because we like released it on Oathbringer Day Everybody was super excited about Oathbringer. Those are great numbers to have, but the true fans are getting through the drought right now, and it is hard out here. It is. It's hard out here for a fan. And so we have made a compendium of several different resources to answer the question, what are you looking forward to in the Cosmere? What's getting you excited? What is keeping you interested? Yeah, keep the excitement alive. And so... We're going to be talking about White Sand Volume 3 in a lot of detail next week, so we're going to hold off on any of the White Sand questions, Uh, but I think that we're just going to dive right in and kind of go back and forth. We pulled these from different users, from different fans, and are just kind of riff off of each one and kind of hopefully get us a little excited again about the interesting 2020 that will be here uh, sooner than you can imagine, folks. All right. To start with, what are you looking forward to? Someone said, the Ardents dealing with Yasna as queen. Great call. This could be really great. There are so many different aspects of Stormlight, of the kind of background and political world that and religious world that has been built up slowly like not as the main point of these stories but there's so much depth and so much richness we know that yasna has been a controversial figure for the voran tradition and the voran church for basically her entire life or certainly her entire adult life um and she is seen as a a heretic heretic. and a, a blasphemizer um and someone who clearly is now at a far more advanced level of understanding of the greater Cosmere than many of the great religious people uh, in her own planet and culture. Well, and I think like as a scholar, Yasna's calling is a search for the truth, right? Like that is kind of her MO. And so... Because we know that this Voran religious tradition has suppressed and edited and hidden so many facets of their history and the figures that factor into their religion, it makes sense that Yasna is like not really bought into that. However, I think another thing in this realm that will be interesting to see is I think it would be interesting to see Yasna kind of have a turnabout as she starts like meeting the heralds Mm -hmm. that are on Rashar and seeing like honor's power and the Stormfather's power come through Dalinar and things like that like really experiencing these otherworldly types of events I think it would be kind of cool to see her suddenly become not Vorin but to have a religious sort of, figure in herself yeah, maybe yeah like, that you could sort totally of, oh, see yeah. yeah you could totally book see 10 her. is Yasna isn't it I think that is correct I Ooh. obviously things can change over time that's like planned for 20 years from now but <laughs> uh yeah I think book 10 right now is stated to be Yasna's book the thing that I love about Yasna and how her role is going to impact everything is that there's such this clear contradiction and divide between what we know about Yasna and like her MO and the society at large. But you need the society to support the war effort and the 
continuation of this fight. Like if we're turning, basically this is kind of a situation that we had in Oathbringer is like the forces of evil led by Odium thought they had one big attack and they could basically end the alliance, whatever of the resistance of humanity quickly. And instead now we're kind of in, oh, it's going to be kind of a siege battle. Like we're going to have to go around these different places and keep playing the games. And now Dalinar is like, kind of unity now so like it's a more difficult game and a longer game and in order to win a long game so much of the culture and society has to support the war effort and yasna is now at the center of all of these different pieces she's like the focal point um in a lot of ways and i would love to see her develop that role maybe even like I don't know what's going to happen, obviously, but kind of replace Dalinar in the way that the story kind of revolves around Dalinar so far uh, in a big way. And you could see is just like all the characters kind of moving towards Dalinar. I would love if we saw a kind of shift to Yasna as a more of a central point in the world, maybe because of Dalinar's death. I don't know. I was going to say, I feel like that's inevitable because at least from the outline so far, we know that Yasna makes it to book 10. Presumably, I mean, I guess Eshenai has flashbacks in this book and she's dead. So anything could happen. We don't have uh, Dalinar book 10. That's... (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, and just like Dalinar is obviously older than Yasna, so you would guess he would die first. And he keeps throwing himself in the middle of Yeah, you know, he's like a warlord and whatever. (laughs) So not like a peaceful hermit living in a hut. <laughs> I am also very excited and very much looking forward to Yasna as queen and how that plays out on Rashar. Yasna as queen makes me say Yasna. <laughs> We're leaving that in. That's going to that's gonna stay in because it's great. Next up, what are you looking forward to? Someone said the shattering of Adenalsium explained in Dragonsteel. Dragonsteel is the... Oh, man, that's so far away. I know. I can't even, like, be excited about it. book. It's the very, very last book of the entire Cosmere So in, like, series. 50 years, yes. when we are both, like, 80 years old... Still doing the pod, ...in obviously. our recliners, yeah, yeah, doing the pod, but obviously it will just be piped directly into your brain through, mm-hmm. like, a microchip. Yep. You'll have virtually subscribed to our brains and yes. we will just this is all correct <laughs> this is how the future is going to happen so much could change in our world over the next 20 30 years <laughs> i can't like you said i can't even be excited about dragon steel yeah it's just like that's out there somewhere kind of like mars it's like <laughs> there but wait mars is much closer <laughs> we, we have drones literally walking around bacteria covering mars we know way more about mars than we do dragon well brandon sanderson is our drone on dragon steel that's a great <laughs> way to think of him he's just like picking up the stories piece by piece yeah i think the shattering of adenalsium is obviously the focal point of the entire cosmere yeah what happened, well okay how is and that then, playing out? like outside of dragon steel I will say that I'm definitely looking forward to getting more like hints and clues about the shattering timeline and storyline thereof. What are you looking forward to? Someone said, I want to see if Adolin really ends up becoming a radiant. I think he'll end up kind of in between maybe. Maya is a cultivation spren and I don't know if Adolin fits the edge dancer guidelines. Yeah, so there's obviously been a lot of speculation about Adolin as a radiant yeah he seems big question to have a special relationship with his spren my well i'm sorry with his, his shard friend. blade yeah. um which is a dead spren maya and there was the big hint that everybody pointed out in oathbringer when he summoned maya faster than 10 heartbeats it was like on beat six or seven he needed it and Mm -hmm. she appeared which is the telltale sign that you know sill can do and other spren can do for their radiances instantly appear so i honestly think he's going to be something more in between than i agree i agree which i mean maybe that's just my hope 
Yeah, I mean, he could be a full Radiant. Because I like, I've always liked that Adolin is not is not a Radiant. I just think it gives like a good tension and good uh, character development for Adolin. I've probably talked about this on the pod before, but I like that his struggle, like as someone who is good looking from a good family rich he doesn't also get know. to be superman yeah exactly it's just like he has so much going for him it's nice to see the areas where he struggles yeah someone even mentioned like is adolin broken enough to be bonded with the sprint because we know they need that break in the spiritual web to kind of weave back together so they can incorporate themselves fully. i mean his mom died when he was a child, and he had to save his father from alcoholism again while he was a child. I so. think there's plenty to work <laughs> with. I'm just saying there is like speculation that, like you said, he has too many things going for him. It would kind of feel um, antithetical to how some of the other characters have been broken. I mean, so I do cleanly. think okay, but I think that like brings up a good point and like a great plot point or like character point for discussion is that in this way Adolin is kind of similar to Shallan and that might be something that brings them together is that you can't always tell from looking at someone whether or not they've suffered right so just because he's just because he's attractive and like smiles a lot and seems pretty happy doesn't necessarily mean he's always been that way. No, I definitely think there is plenty of room and justification for Adolin to become a full Radiant. However, I imagine something in between uh, where Maya is more of a... Like, we have to still account for Maya's dead. Right. She can't... Or unless she can be fully restored, that would make the Spren Bond normal. So I kind of think of it as like a, um, a division of power where the Radiants are absorbing a lot of power from the Spren to do these incredible things, Adolin would still be very limited and maybe more like an Honor Blade in the oh. respects that like an Honor Blade only works if you have the yeah, Honor Yeah, if you're blade. wielding it. Yes. And so you don't have the power or the power can leave you by being unbonded or unwielding of the Honor Blade. So basically Adolin would kind of be the same. He would that be able would to, be cool. He would be able to maybe use Stormlight like a He would have some blade. advantages, yes. but would still be limited. Yeah, or like he'd burn through it. I think that was the thing um, that Seth was always burning through way more. Yeah. Um, so Adolin would be like an extreme version of that. Like Maya's a very poor... Conductor. Uh, yes, of investiture. Something along those lines is my guess slash hope. Cool. Ooh, I think uh, this one's for you, as uh, <laughs> we know how much you love Amia. <laughs> WTF is Amia and Akana, and how it could destroy worlds, plural, if people from Rashard discover what's there. One, just great question. Great question of mystery, like citing things in your own question. That's a good question. <laughs> just a solid question right there. However... I think Amy is clearly one of the great mysteries. We have virtually oh, no... Oh, okay, okay. Here's my idea. Okay. <laughs> because what I think this quote, it could destroy worlds, plural, is referring to is the fact that Amy is sort of like enmeshed with the cognitive realm. Mm. And so worlds it's meaning like the physical realm and the cognitive realm maybe akina is like the upside down city of amia oh. in the cognitive realm oh you know what i mean yes i i understand and we have seen that the upside down is obviously just sending me down a stranger things route and everything's terrible but, but you we've know already what i seen mean it. yeah we've seen the the cities in the cognitive realm. And I think that what I believe it could mean is that Amia could be a center point for the technology that came from Ashen. Like the, okay, so imagine, you know how like we uh, look at the pyramids of Egypt 
and we have all these like conspiracy theories or these theories about like how they got there and how they're not really built the way that they're said and everybody likes to speculate rashar we know does have this period where advanced people came over somehow is that technology is that through a cognitive realm whatever what if amia is kind of the storing of all that knowledge and stuff in many ways so like well the kind of that's why it's shrouded in darkness too or not darkness but like the fog well that it's shrouded it. because the amians are protecting it i know but i'm saying that's why that's what they're protecting is the knowledge and maybe the no because i think I, of uh, how they came before i think we know that the like cloaking is because in the past Amia was scourged because the quote unquote humans of Rashar are like afraid of Amians. And we see that with uh, like Axes of the Collector and stuff too, mm-hmm. that there's like a lot of bias or prejudice against them because they have weird powers. Yeah. No, I think basically what I'm trying to get at is that the idea of how it could destroy worlds is if it gives the Rasharians a jumping off point like a shard pool, but maybe even bigger where you can, you know how they move from the different cities with the gate. What yeah. if you could do that, but on to like a, other planets a or planet something? scale. Yeah, basically mm, maybe. So my idea is basically like if the Rasharians f- discover what's in Amia that could destroy worlds it's the ability to move their society and like go out and be super aggressive with all the other societies or i guess like if it is a portal it could be a portal for the fused yeah, and like exactly. odium's right army. now being used against them yeah. and um you know in the future possibly the rasharians could use it against other people that's my light speculation. But we have no idea because we know very little about Amia. Next up, someone is looking forward to Vavena, Vasher, and Nightblood reunion. Which... Aren't we all? Yeah, is <laughs> the mass speculation. Ever since Azure in Oathbringer was unveiled, it has been this walk down memory lane of we know Vasher's on Rashar as Zahel, We know Nightblood reunited with Zeth. Now we have Vivenna, who was last seen going away from the action. Uh, But Nightblood is now, like, in the possession of Zeth. Oh, my gosh. Who is the sworn bodyguard of the most famous man on the planet, Dalinar Kolin. And that dude was also the assassin in white. So, like, people are going to hear that this assassin white has a crazy black blade that just sucked up half an army. And, and Zahel, doesn't Zahel work for yeah. Dalinar? Yeah, I mean, yeah, Zahel is Yeah, so it's like they're going to be in the same camp. Yeah, well, I, who knows right now where Z- Zahel is, because I don't think he is with the army proper at the moment. Yeah. However, he's going to hear, everybody's going to hear about Zeth because <laughs> he was the assassin in white. He swore loyalty and then yeah. literally had a magic black sword suck up half an army and just like well, leave them in whatever their little weird And he like shape. leaves a cognitive imprint behind everywhere he walks now. Like he's not a very subtle yes, person exactly. just walking around. So we, that, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Nightblood is going to draw Vivenna and Vasher in and who knows the exact backstory, but like Vivenna at times doesn't seem very happy with Vasher, possibly yeah. needing to execute him. Yeah, we've talked about all the of the questions yeah. yeah, posed by Vivenna and her relationship with Vasher. So I'm definitely looking forward to getting some more tidbits on that whole scenario because it seems a little juicy. Very juicy indeed. And to keep it Nightblood juicy. (laughs) Currently, Nightblood is paired up not with Vivenna and Vasher, but with Lyft and Zeth, which is another great 
trio. Like you don't... I like how this person said, wacky hijinks. Yes, <laughs> wacky hijinks between Lyft, Zeth, and Nightblood is what they are looking forward to. My favorite trio, definitely. This little team is the best. It is so perfect. Not only that Zeth is a master of the different surges and can it be as like a teacher to lift in many respects um but that zeth is very depressing like kaladin's depressing but zeth is just oh oh my god always <sighs> sad yeah it's real and it's, and it's, it's dark real tough, and yeah. sad and like way more murder at least kaladin you're like he's a good dude like he's a he's gonna be okay he's just sad but, but that's zeth what's like even like, worse about zeth yeah yeah but like he was lied to. He was kicked out of like his own society. Like yeah, but much he like the people in the town, is a victim. Oh, he's a victim. Much like the people in the town, they made the choices. Their king in the castle was dead for many years, and they were still punishing each other all weird. Like they made those. choices. I'm not saying he, you know, doesn't have some bad actions i'm just saying it makes it even more tortured that you're like oh man on some level this like wasn't your fault but it was your fault but you didn't know and like i think that lift is going to rub off quite a bit on zeth and hopefully nightblood could lift what a weird little team it's the weirdest it's team so ever. weird you just talk about it and it's just like one of those situations that you're just like why would this ever happen? And then you're so happy that it's happened. Well, it's like Lyft is so weird on her own. Just and then herself, Zeth yeah. is so weird on his own. And, and Nightblood is, is so weird. weird. <laughs> and now they're all together. And it's the greatest thing in the entire Cosmere. <laughs> like, I don't know how long this is going to I could do last. like a whole spinoff series yeah. with like Lyft and Zeth Like you and remember uh, Detective Pokemon came out. Everybody <laughs> was super excited. They're like, yes, I love Pokemon. I love humans on Detective Stories. Now, instead of that, we have Lyft, Zeth, Nightblood. Detective Nightblood. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So good. And it's it's such a great jumping off point and like just how weird things can get. You never really think about this, or at least I don't think about this straight up, but like stories can be weird. Weird things can happen. Unexpected things can happen. It's not uh, the normal, boring world. Yeah, like it we... doesn't have to be the exact hero's journey. Like yeah, exactly. X happens, then Y happens. And so I'm just excited for like, this seems like a little bit of just weirdness that's all been thrown together in a magical, weird glitter tornado. <laughs> <laughs> okay next one is looking forward to seeing harmony interact with any of the other shards especially if dalinar becomes honor slash unity some shard himself jumping back over to uh scadriel and looking at our best religious friend meditation expert zazed i think that Zayz has always been one of my favorite characters, and we know in the letters he sent out like a message. He was like, hey, I'm interested, Hoyd, not knowing that it was Hoyd, but I'm interested in you and other people in the Cosmere, and like, I've got some shit that I need to talk about. So I want to see him talk about that stuff. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's always exciting to get like a little gift of seeing Sazed again in different ways around the Cosmere now that he's Harmony. I also find it super interesting to watch him change because he's the only person that we've seen so far, both before and after ascending to Shardom. Um, and so we're like really getting to see firsthand how that transition affects a person we've heard people talk about it talk about how holding the power of a shard changes that person's like fundamental nature and who they are which you would expect of you know anyone ascending to godhood um but i just think it's cool to kind of get to see like step by step um say is becoming different yeah there's even speculation that he could slip into what we have just called discord a kind of oh like anti-harmony yeah basically mm. um and that perhaps zay's personality is the demonstration of 
how the shards are acting upon the person and the person is acting upon the shards. Yeah. And so like, while yeah, Zays can totally be a uniter and try to, he's very nice and like, you know, introducing people to different religions that he mm-hmm. thinks they're going to like. He's and a he's great always harmony been creator. like a very even keeled person. Yeah. However, he also had a huge falling off, a huge rejection of everything, a deep, deep hole that he fell into. And maybe that same type of thing can happen, but now wielding two shards, and that could lead Harmony to become Discord. That's at least a theory, that Harmony ends up being like a a failed son type thing, like a, you know, a yeah. failed prophet. Interesting. Looking forward to if and when Iron Eyes lands on Rishar. Hoyd reached out to Harmony in one of his letters, who responded that he can't do much directly due to conflicting intents, but would be willing to negotiate assistance via his agents. Marsh, with his full complement of allomantic and most ferrochemical abilities, combined with abundant metals on a stone planet, would be a sight. Compounded steel strength, healing, iron pulling, steel pushing, pewter, tin, whatever remains of his ATM store, he has to be one of the most dangerous dudes in the galaxy right now. And I think that's a pretty accurate call. I can't really think of someone who is as powerful in a straight-up fight as a fully-powered Mistborn. And Marsh has some additional skills as well because of Farukami. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying he's not powerful, but he is not a Mistborn. He's an Inquisitor. And yes, so he always has that weakness of being able to be controlled, I guess, by Harmony now. Yeah. Although you wonder if that would still be the case if he was on a different planet. Like how, how much does control? Yeah. Is how does that have? affect yeah. Could that he be little controlled by Odium? back door? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, does that mean any shard or like whatever shard is on Anything the planet? Anything powerful enough, like that emotional push when you overwhelm someone. I think the same type of thing if a shard is present. They might be able to overwhelm. Right. Could Marsh. like hack in. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, just kind of a brute force over yeah. whatever mm-hmm. limit that is. So does he become a accidental powerful weapon uh against our Risharian friends? Uh, because Zay's, you know, makes a mistake in sending him to help out. Uh that would be a huge first you get the oh shit moment of <laughs> iron eyes on rashar and you're like he's totally gonna help everyone they're at this super low moment and you know they need to be saved by something and this is it iron eyes just dropping in out of nowhere and then nope instead he's been corrupted by odium and is like the final nail in the coffin i mean he is death on schedule i am in general i am interested to see more from marsh because i think it's kind of exciting to see him like popping around in the background every once in a while um but i'm excited to see what happens with him and like new lord ruler slash kelsier maybe whatever he is now i mean it's definitely kelsier but i get you but you know is it really kelsier we've talked about this exactly uh check out our misborn secret history episode for all the speculation on what kelsier is now (laughs) The way that I see Marsh interacting with any of the other worlds is still very limited. I can't imagine him actually being like a plot significant device yet on like, I don't think he's going to show up in the first five books of Rashar. That's just my opinion. Maybe later books. But I don't Agreed. think we're we're quite there yet. Plus, it seems like there's stuff going on on Scadrial. Like you know? that he needs to be there. Exactly. Like yeah. if you're Harmony, you're kind of like, I mean, I would like to help out on other planets, but like I got to take care of my own house first. I mean, he did say in that letter that he was willing to send one of his agents, but that could also be that the Chandra. Yeah, like, exactly. One be, of the faceless yeah. immortals. So I think this person who is excited about Iron Eyes on Rashar is very similar to the next person who said 
They were looking forward to major crossovers becoming a thing. Surge Binders fighting Alamancers or Farukamis, Awakeners versus Shardbearers, and Hemalurgy, and all the other systems kind of clashing into one another. I feel like this is basically, you know, a specific example of the overall major crossovers. Yeah. I love that if anyone is looking for some super random speculation, you can go back and check our uh, Cosmere cage match yeah. when we did uh, the match. Our cage match episodes are great for this like crossover type thing where we really get into the nitty gritty of like, would this work? Would this not work? How would it work? We think that overall, the major crossovers are still a ways off, though. Uh, And when we say a ways off, we mean like a couple of years off. I think we'll start to see more and more creep in like we did with Azure on Rashar. Yes, Um, And I think Brandon's even said that, you know, when he first started out writing, he had to be super cautious about putting stuff like that in. But as he's gotten more popular and he can do more and as like his fans have expressed a lot of interest and excitement about it. Yeah, he has a little bit more freedom to do a little bit more i think that there has to be at least a little bit of kind of a conclusion to some of the main plots that yeah. we have set up and kind of the main planet level plots now that's not to say obviously nothing happens on the planets after we shift to the greater cosmere perspective but the idea of like an army you know, Kaladin and his squires going to fight a bunch of Awakeners or in a type of like Marvel Cinematic Universe cross. I just don't think that's going to happen yet. Like I can reverse my opinion in 10 years and be like, get hyped. It's about to happen. But (laughs) for right now, I think that we are looking at more crossovers, but nothing major for a little while. Someone said that they are looking forward to seeing Navani bond the sibling and begin using the tower as a giant fabriel, which I don't know if that's something you can be looking forward to because I think it's highly speculative, but great idea. I want it to happen. What a great idea. Do you think, though, <laughs> that the idea of the tower is a giant fabriel? Oh, well, yeah, definitely. Okay, so... When we at least believe that an individual may be bonded with these super powerful entities, be able to control that giant Fabriel? Or is it some type of teamwork like system that mm. needs a bunch of people yeah. you know, all working it at once to kind of Yeah. Yeah. I think I don't think that those two things are necessarily connected like this person is saying that if Navadi were to bond the sibling, that would create the working Fabriel. Um, I think that they can get the tower Fabriel working without bonding the sibling. Because I think, like you said, if we use the portal that they took to get to Urethiru as a template... You can imagine that that would kind of be how the whole thing thing would work. Yeah, where you did kind of need a team of Radiance to operate the portal. You can imagine that the whole tower, all of Urethiru, would kind of operate on a team of Radiance-empowered individuals working it. And Dalinar has repeatedly, and now Adolin has repeatedly brought up this idea of why is all the cool stuff only made for war? Why are the shard plates? Why are the shard blades? Why do they not make a shard hammer? Uh, not for war, sorry, but like a, a shard shovel. Uh, yeah, there and, you go. <laughs> and they did. They made a shard city. Or they made yeah. a Rithiru that could be... F- that was just like their heating thing. Yeah, and exactly. like water flowing. Yeah, the indoor plumbing in a yeah, society that like is mainly camping. Like you, they've, they're like a couple steps above camping in a lot of glamping. situations. Yeah. They're all glamping. <laughs> so Urethiru is the advanced beacon of a city, you know, a true city atop the hill that could have been where everything was kind of devoted not 
to be used in war, but to be used in the creation of civilization. As far as personally what I am looking forward to is I'm actually really excited about the non-book things that are being talked about or worked on or fully confirmed. Ooh, are you talking about like cinematic universe? Well, obviously, everybody is excited (laughs) and looking forward to the possibility of TV show or movies about the Cosmere. There is a production company. I don't have the name memorized, but uh, we will like all have DMG the name. DMG or DGM or something yeah. like that. We will all have it memorized soon uh, because they're working on Mistborn right now as, I believe, a TV show. So that's already out there. But I'm actually thinking more about um, some of the video games that I have seen. And mm. the, I think there's a, a tabletop game or an expansion to an existing tabletop game. Um, that there's a lot of expanding going on in the Cosmere extended universe. And some of these things are not directly controlled by Brandon. And he's just given some of his creative license over, but like artwork, you know, there's so much beautiful artwork that's done by Brandon's team that he's put together, um, for his different works. But then there's so much great... Even just with the things that exist right now as like inserts in the book, wouldn't it be so great to get like a coffee table book with all of those beautiful drawings and pieces of art and like maps and stuff in it? Yeah. I mean, I would. That's on my my wish list. Brandon, if you're listening. Make a map book. I would really like Mm -hmm. a coffee table book. (laughs) But I think that there is a lot of possibility when it comes to, you know, different board games or different video games to play Mm -hmm. with this universe and kind of develop this universe like just think about how simple a video game this would be or how we've seen this done before and like you could just change the story we have the island of patchy which has a bunch of dangerous things and like traps and dudes who don't want anyone else there so you could have a video game when you are just a character who has to make it to the center of patchy and kind of uncover the story of six of the dusk but you know you basically play as six of the dust on that it's perfect for that i would play that yeah in a heartbeat that's like an easy video game that's like it's not a super expansive like 500 hour plus game but you just you could tell the story through a visual medium and that really just opens it up to a lot of possibilities i know books are great but seeing st- this stuff come alive is really what I'm looking forward to. All right. Well, right now I'm mainly just looking forward to my white sand book arriving and reading it. (laughs) In a house that is all set up and not mainly boxes. That's true. I think we are actually at the not mainly boxes stage. Oh, 100%. I think we have like one or two boxes left. We're so good at life. It just took us a long time. (laughs) Thanks for hanging in there with us, guys. Um, Thanks for listening. We will see you on Facebook and Reddit and Twitter. And until next time, life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. Journey before destination.